Hi, and thanks for coming. My name is Rich Bowen, and I am the community manager for the CentOS project. Uh, I've been at Red Hat for almost nine years, and I've been doing the CentOS project for a little over three years. And um, I'm going to be talking about what happens when you make your community angry as a community manager, because eventually you're going to. So I'm going to start with, with story time. Um, I mentioned I'm the, the CentOS community manager, but I'm going to tell you a different story. Um, in 2013, I was the SourceForge community manager. And uh, if you are of a certain age, you know what SourceForge was. And uh, I, uh, was, I was there in 2013 when my manager, Roberto Gallopini, sent out this, this uh, blog post announcing a new program for projects that were hosted at SourceForge as a way to share the profit that SourceForge was making on the back of their communities. And um, this was not received as well as it was expected by management. And uh, as the community manager, it was my job to appease the community when um, it became angry that SourceForge was making money off of them, as though somehow they didn't know that already. But more importantly, as part of this profit sharing, one of the things that SourceForge did was package third-party software in with your software release when you sent it out, not necessarily with your consent. And this was received very, very badly and uh, led to some, some terrible press with SourceForge. The community was very angry, and it was my job to sort of appease them a little bit. But appease is definitely the wrong word here, as you'll see as we go forward. So that's probably not the story you were expecting me to tell. So I'll tell a different story. Um, on December 8th of last year, my project, the CentOS project, announced that we would be discontinuing CentOS Linux and instead focusing our efforts on CentOS Stream. And CentOS Stream is similar to CentOS Linux, but it's different in important ways that made the community very angry. Um, I am not here to talk about that announcement. I'm not here to talk about that decision or justify it or explain it or tell you it was the right thing. But I'm talking more about what you do when your community gets angry, because they're going to occasionally, no matter what project you're working on. Your project is going to make a decision that's going to make the user community, the developer community, angry. And as the community manager, it may not have been your decision, but it's your responsibility. So um, I have a lot of things that I want to say in a very short time to say them. But uh, there's, there's two points that I want you to remember throughout all of this, and I'll be reiterating them as we go through, because they're really, they're really the central points of all of this. And the first one is to remember which hat you're wearing. Now, there's, no, there's not necessarily a right answer to this. Some, some community managers are entirely representing the community, whereas others are entirely representing their employer. And those are both valid models. It depends what your community looks like. Um, the tricky thing is that, that you're doing both if you're doing your job well. And so you, you do want to remember which hat you're wearing. And if you are confused about which hat you're wearing, you need to stay, take a step back and answer that question first, because that needs to be in the forefront of your mind throughout all of the other things that you're going to do as part of being a community manager. Um, so I have to decide daily to be the voice of the community to Red Hat, even when I disagree with what the community is saying, even when maybe it feels like a personal attack against me, um, even when it's going to make my coworkers angry. I have to remember that that's, that that's my job um, and, and not take things personally when I am perceived as part of the enemy. Um, another way to say this, so this is really the same point said a different way. You got to remember whose side you're on, and ideally you're not confused about this. Um, very frequently when you are dealing with an angry community, you are asked to take sides. And um, it can be 
the, the conversation can start to sound like us, the company against them, the, the community, the, the people that are using our stuff for free, particularly if you're, in a, if you're in a company that relies on open source software. The people that use the software for free may be seen as the enemy. Maybe they're, they're undercutting our profits in some way. Um, if the community is ever seen as the enemy, then you have a much bigger problem. You, you have an education problem where, where the company needs to be educated to understand that, that the community is really what's keeping them afloat. So those are, those are two points that I'll continually come back to as we go through the rest of these. Um, so I mentioned December 8th, we made this announcement. And then I took a few weeks off for Christmas. Um, and when I came back, I had the opportunity to read through three weeks worth of email in two days. And it was fascinating to watch, um, very obviously, the community going through these sort of canonical stages of grief. But when you are working in a community that is largely distributed, as open source communities are, somebody's always finding out the news today for the first time. Um, so, so we announced the end of life of a product, and that end of life is December 31st this year. And there are people that are going to discover that the first week of January next year. And they're going to be angry all over again. And uh, they're going to question why we made a decision, and they're going to try to talk us out of it. They're going to do the, the bargaining and the, uh, the, the, the depression, the, the being furious at me personally for doing that. And it's just not as simple as saying, well, we got through that, so everything's peachy now. And uh, so I've been going back through this again and again and again all year. And it's been a, it's been a difficult year, but it's also been a difficult year for our community. And so I need to make sure that I don't make this about me, because it's just not. Um, you, you have to be willing to be patient and listen and, and understand that you may not get to that acceptance. Um, a large number of our community members are going to switch to Debian, and that's, that's fine. That's their call, and that's not, that's not a failing on my part or on theirs. And so it's, it's really important to be compassionate and to not get defensive. So one of the obvious reactions that I've had all the way through this is when people get angry, I get defensive. And I start saying, well, you're just wrong. And um, we're right. And we did the right thing. And you just don't understand it yet. I just haven't explained it well enough yet. And uh, that is often a sign that you've forgotten whose side you're on. Um, and then I have to remind myself that I'm, I'm the community advocate. I'm, the, I'm on their side. And they have, have good points. And so uh, you got to listen. You've got to understand where the community is coming from. Um, you have to understand their grievances and acknowledge that they're probably right. That can, be, that can be difficult when it feels personal. But it also helps you do your job better. It helps you advocate better for the community's needs within the business, which is making decisions for the, the shareholders and not for the, the free software users, which is also legitimate. So you're, you're riding that line, trying to remember which hat you're wearing. Um, as a community manager, your most important asset your only asset is the trust of the community. And if you cannot maintain that, then you need to turn the job over to somebody else um, who, can, who can have that, that trust of the community. <clears throat> now, one of the things that I had to do very early on was acknowledge that the community was right to be angry. Um, we, we made a change to their world, and they were angry about that, and that was right and legitimate and correct. The business, on the other hand, made a decision, and they were right and correct. And those two things have to be held in tension. This is one of the weird things about working in open source. There's this constant tension between everything can and should be free, and we like our paychecks. 
And that tension, when you're in an open source program office, when you're in a community manager position, that tension is the definition of your job. And that's, that, can be, that can be very stressful. And the tendency is to just say, well, I just haven't explained it well enough. You just don't understand yet. I need to explain it again. And it's, it's, it's a lot more listening and understanding the reasons for the grievances. And I'll, I'll get back to, to grievances in a moment, because you can't always fix them. Um, another thing is to remember that it's, it's, not, it's not personal. It can feel exquisitely personal. It feels exceptionally personal when you get threats in email. And it, it, it's, it wasn't my decision. It wasn't my, but, but, it, but it's my job. It's my job to be the face of that decision. Um, and if you're in a situation like this where the community is angry and you don't feel that it's at all personal, then maybe you don't have enough compassion <laughs> and uh, maybe you're in the, in the wrong job because compassion is such an important part of being a community manager. Um, so, yeah. We move on to the, the next major topic here, which is talking to the press. And uh, I recommend that you don't. Um, I recommend that you, that if you are, if you're contacted by the press, that you clearly understand your company's policy about talking to the press and that you talk to your, your press and real public relations and whatever department and make sure that you're doing it right. Now, if you're in a position like this where you are, you are the face of a project, hopefully you've had some sort of press training. And if you have not, then you should seek it out. Um, the, the people that, that do the press for your company will appreciate it enormously if you seek them out and ask for this training because they don't want to clean up after you when you say stupid things. Um, and and it's, it's really easy to say stupid things, particularly if you are a compassionate, empathic person and you, you trust the, the, uh, the reporter who's talking to you. Now, I should say, most of the reporters that I've dealt with, practically all of them, are ethical and they're committed to truth and they're trying to, to do their job and tell a story, but, but also I've encountered a few who are looking for a catchy headline. And um, if, you, if you twist the story just a little bit, you can get a great headline. And um, so this, this sounds incredibly cynical, but when you are talking to the press, assuming that you ever do talk to the press, um, you gotta, you got to filter these questions through the, the cynical side of yourself and think how your answer can be misconstrued. Um, and I've, I've said stupid things to, to reporters, and they are perfectly happy to print those stupid things because, you know, I, I said it. You know, I said it wearing my, my company hat. Um, the other side of talking to the press is that when you are speaking on social media, you're talking to the press. And um, it, it can be really easy to say the snarky thing on Twitter because it's just a joke. And then you find yourself in an article the next day with uh, Red Hat spokesperson said. And um, your, your personal Twitter account and your, your project Twitter account, you may imagine somewhere in your mind that they are two separate things. And you can say the one thing the one place and the other the other place. And that's also not true. Um, your, your joke tweets are official statements of the company. Now, of course, they're not, but that's beside the point. Um, so it's, uh, it, it, can, it can feel unjust when you say, well, I was just saying that as a private citizen. But uh, you, don't, you don't get that, that privilege when you're in, in a of public facing position. Um, as the great philosopher Socrates said, there is honor in the tweet not sent. So, um, so you're, wait, did I? Yeah. Um, you're, we, we all wear all of these hats, right? But the, the, the dirty secret is that the question, which hat am I wearing, is a lie. You're always wearing all of your hats. And the other 
The other dirty part of this secret is that you don't get to pick which hat you're wearing. I can say I'm up here wearing my red hat, but someone in the audience can say, well, I was acting as the official spokesperson of the CentOS project. And it, it's more about how the listener hears your words than your intent. And so you have to, you have to decide which hat you're wearing. You have to be clear on which hat you're wearing. But as my friend Theo Schlossnagel said, if there is a fundamental conflict between the different hats you think you're wearing, then that's a problem. Um, if, if you are playing different parts and those parts are in conflict and you have different values with your different hats, then uh, that's, that's, not, that's not honest. You're not being honest with yourself and you're not being honest with your listeners. Um, Theo, I, I worked for Theo for a while, and, and I just I always appreciate his insight into things. I, uh, yeah. Um, anyway, the next major point that I want to make is that you should always tell the truth. And this uh, this came up during the the early weeks of this. Uh, yes, sir. I think you have some advice in course providence. Yeah. <laughs> the. Uh, during the early weeks after we made the, the CentOS change announcement, um, people would ask me questions that uh, were, were leading or argumentative. And, and it was my job to tell the truth, um, even in times when it made us look terrible. And one of the reasons for this, I mean, obviously, one of the reasons is that you should tell the truth because it's the truth. But the other, the other reason is that your lies will surely find you out. Um, your users, your customers, your audience are way smarter than you are. Um, there's more of them. They have done more research. They know the deep corners that you haven't learned yet. And if you try to gloss over the truth, they'll come back the next day with, well, I have this evidence here that shows that you were lying, and now you've, tr you've doubled your problem. Not only have you uh, violated their trust yesterday, now you've done it again today. And so telling the truth um, is, is just, it's, it's critical because you can't get away with it. In an open source project in particular, you can't get away with trying to uh, make yourself look better. The other part of this is if you don't know the answer, don't make something up, say, I don't know, and then go find out. Um, you, you don't get to keep saying, I don't know. That's not, that's not an answer, because they're going to ask you again tomorrow. So you, uh, you have an obligation to find out that answer and give that answer honestly to the community. Now, the other side of this is sometimes you're not allowed to give the answer. And that's OK, too, and you have to say that. Now, to those of you who are uh, not North Americans, we have this, this phrase, um, throwing someone under the bus, which means uh, to, to criticize or blame or punish someone else in order to make myself look better. And for me to throw my employer under the bus and say, well, they just did this to make money, or they just did this because they hate you, or, or because they hate our competitor, or whatever, um, it, it also will come back to visit you. Uh, it's important to, to be honest when you're told you cannot speak about something. You can say, well, I'm not, I'm not authorized to answer that question. Um, that, that, should also, that should often be accompanied with, you need to talk to this other person, um, which can feel like passing the buck, but it's, it's doing your job as well. Uh, because once again, trust is the core of your job. Um, now at Red Hat, trust is our only asset because we don't sell software, we sell support. And so if people don't trust us, then we no longer have a business model. And so in our case in particular, and for those of you who work for companies that rely heavily on open source, this is also the case for you. The trust is what you sell. <clears throat> now, during the bargaining phase, um, I was often asked, can't you just go talk to so-and-so and get them to change this? And 
this was one of the places in which I had to be brutally honest. This is the decision that we've made. I'm not going to change it. It's not going to change. Um, you can wish all you want, but we're not reversing this decision. Um, in other situations, in that SourceForge story I told before some of you were here, um, that was a decision that I had some influence on, and I could go argue for that and get that decision changed. Um, and you need to be honest about that with the people that are asking the questions. Don't, don't make people think, oh, I'm going to go bat for you and, and get this changed, if that's not true. Because then, once again, you have undermined that trust that you have. Um, and, and that can feel, and people said this to me in those early weeks, that can feel very callous for me to say, well, this is just the way it is, and you're going to have to deal with it. So you know, hopefully, you can be more tactful than that. But the fact is that if you can't change it, don't pretend that you can. Um, and then, you know, one other thing, don't get fired. Um, <laughs> remembering, remembering which hat you wear, remember, but also remembering that this, this is your job and you're getting paid for it and you're, you're working for a company. Um, don't get fired for this. Now, there are cases where it's worth getting fired for it. If, if your company does something unethical and you are the face of that, then maybe this is something you should get fired for. Maybe it's something you should stand up for and get fired for. I am certainly not the person to, to suggest that to you. I hope that none of you get fired over such a situation. Um, but uh, you know, before, before you click send on that email, think through what hat you're wearing. Think how that will be perceived to the fourth person down the line that it's been forwarded to who's in you know, HR or whatever. And, and don't, don't get fired in order, to, <laughs> in order to make a joke or to, uh, in order to pass the blame to someone else. Um, so don't, don't burn any of, of your bridges in your advocacy for either the customer or the company. So that, that is uh, what I have time for. Um, I know this was really short, but we have like one minute for questions, I think. We have three minutes for questions. Yes? I, I got a slightly naive question, but I mean, CentOS is a open source project. So just because you're end of life in it doesn't mean that the community couldn't step up and maintain it, or could it be put into a foundation or something so that if people still want to see it be a viable thing? Well, in this particular case, um, the community did exactly that. The community said, well, screw you, and they forked, and they went off and did something else. And that, that is, that's always a viable option in an open source project. And so there are, there are four or five prominent, well, there's like two prominent ones, but four or five other ones that have sprung up out of, the, uh, out of this decision and are going right along and doing their thing. And that's one of the great things about open source. And, uh, you know, that, that may not be the case if you're not in an open source company, but, uh, but it certainly happened here. Yes? Uh, great uh, presentation. If you could somehow go back to late November and advise uh, the board a different approach, any lessons learned from that two sessions? Uh, well, um, I think that the answer to that is communicate more sooner. Um, however, in this particular case, the day after the decision was made, we announced it, and so which is why the announcement felt so unpolished because it was. And um, you know, it's a double-edged sword because um, if we had waited until it was more polished, we would be accused of holding on to it. Um, because we announced it the first day, we were accused of having known long before. I mean, the thing is, when you, when you rely on trust as your, as your currency, um, that can always be questioned. And that, that, that was one of the reasons for a lot of the anger, was, was feeling misled. And that's hard to get around, because the people who cannot see inside the machinery can make all sorts of assumptions about it. So. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a hard question. I have, I have many answers that don't really fit with the theme of this talk, but, but uh, yeah, it's a good question. Yes? What do you think the first step would be to get the trust of your community back after things like this? 
So that's, that's another presentation, but what we have done is um, take as many steps as possible to open up our governance at all levels. So um, the, the, board of, the board of directors for the project was always kind of meeting in private phone calls. Now that's public and streamed on YouTube. Um, the, the, the CentOS project is tightly tied to the Red Hat Enterprise Linux project and RHEL moved all of its processes upstream now. And so that's all done in public. And so, you know, my answer is similar to my answer here is communicate more earlier and be as transparent as you possibly can. And when you can't, um, be honest about that. We are out of time. Thank you so much for your attention.